Hello everyone, and welcome to the second lecture of the Reliable and Interpretable Artificial Intelligence uh, graduate course taught at uh, ETH Zurich. My name is Martin Vechev and I'm a professor at ETH. And uh, in this lecture, we're going to be focusing on uh, adversarial attacks. So generating uh, adversarial examples. So before we get into the whys and hows of generating adversarial examples, I want to mention this article that appeared a couple of years ago in the communications of the ACM, uh, which is called uh, Human Level Intelligence or Any More Likeabilities by Adnan Darvish. And um, <clears throat> one of the interesting quotes in the articles is the following. It says, uh, you know, we need a new generation of AI researchers who are well versed in well versed in and appreciate classical AI, machine learning, and computer science more broadly, while also being informed about AI history. So essentially what uh, he's uh, mentioning and referring to are, you know, kind of the topics that, you know, this course covers, which is combination of uh, data-driven learning-based uh, uh, optimization and uh, symbolic methods. Um, so just an, another data point that, uh, supports what we're trying to do here. So the plan for today for adversarial examples is the following. Uh, first, we're going to show a few more examples in various domains, various application domains beyond those which we showed in the first introductory lecture. We're going to discuss why adversarial examples exist. And then we're going to uh, focus on uh, techniques for generating adversarial examples, both targeted, uh, targeted attacks and untargeted attacks, okay? One thing to mention here is that the techniques that we're going to be looking at are going to be useful not only for generating adversarial examples, but also later when we're doing uh, um, adversarial training, incorporating background priors, provable training, and so on and so forth, okay? So just keep that in mind. Another thing to mention is that from now on, the course uh, tends to get uh, more and more technical. So, you know, after the examples, we're going to start looking at more technical things, and um, and then uh, gradually it, it will just stay like this. Okay. So let's look at adversarial examples. Um, so here's one definition by Young Goodfellow, one of the co-authors of the well-known uh, deep learning book. What he says is, adversarial examples are inputs to machine learning models that an attacker has intentionally designed to cause the model to make a mistake, right? Um, now, whether you have an attacker or you, know, you don't have an attacker, uh, you just want to uh, check how good your model is, um, you know, these uh, adversarial examples uh, would still be relevant. Um, that's a very fairly high level uh, informal definition. And from uh, you know last lecture, we already saw this uh, these examples here, adding uh, imperceptible noise and getting the model to misclassify the panda to a gibbon, uh, putting uh, stickers on stop signs and getting the uh, deep learning model to predict that it's a 45 mile per hour sign, the speed sign, and uh, you know on the bottom right having these uh, three different uh, neural neural networks, each uh, misbehaving in a different way in the different pictures. Basically, one of them always tells to go to the right and the other to say to go to the left, okay? While in each of these cases, um, you know, most humans would, uh, even children, would be able to tell what the right classification, what the right decision should be. Let's look at a few more uh, examples, um, settings where adversarial examples are, are relevant. So, just so you don't get the idea that there is a no, only noise-based perturbations to the, to, the, to the pixels of an image. For instance, uh, geometric transformations, geometric perturbations, you can also talk about adversarial geometric perturbations by, for instance, taking an image like uh, seven here, labeled I0 on the left, top left, and um, rotating that image by some degrees, in this case, negative 35 degrees. So in the first case, the network correctly classifies the image as seven, while um, once we rotate it and obtain this adversarial image, right, that looks like a seven, or somebody can even say it's a three, um, but it's kind of more like a seven, right? Uh, so the network classifies it as a three. 
Now in practice, this, uh, you know, when you do rotations, the, uh, the images, the adversarial images that you obtain, which lead to a uh, misclassification, actually can be, uh, can be achieved with much smaller um, values for the rotation angle. You know, just few degrees to the left or to the right. Uh, so they really look like what you expect, you know, look like a seven, but it gets misclassified to some other, other digit. Um, now one point to mention here, which I already mentioned in the first lecture, is that um, you, when you're generating adversarial examples, you may be generating them right at the input uh, of the deep model, or you may be generating them at the start of some pre-processing and uh, once the preprocessing is done, you know, the output of that preprocessing would go into the deep model, but you'd be changing the input of the preprocessing or the transformation before going into the deep model. And this is, this is an example of this setting here where you are, you know, trying to figure out, figure out angles by which to rotate the image um, so that once the rotation um, transformation has happened, is taken place, and that's an example of some form of preprocessing. Then uh, the resulting image gets uh, misclassified by the network. So this type of preprocessing happens in uh, various settings. Um, you know, maybe there is a computation of the embeddings in NLP. Maybe there is audio processing, as we we'll look. Uh, maybe there's uh, you know, geometric uh, transformations and many others. Uh, right. So that's one point. Um, here is. Uh, uh, here is another example, which is more on the physical side. Um, you have a picture on the left of Reese Witherspoon, and if you put glasses on, on that image, then uh, the network misclassifies it to some other other name, uh, other actor. Um, similar examples with the with the glasses. Um, if you have uh, a person on the left, uh, Lujo Bauer, and uh, you know, you take some put some glasses on him. Uh, the network uh, misclassifies him to uh, John Malkovich, right? Now, one thing I wanted to mention here is, you know, we're talking about adversarial examples. We're talking about adversarial attacks. However, as, as we're going through the, through the lecture, I'll also be mentioning the corresponding uh, certification problem. So not only generating inputs that are unwanted, these adversarial examples, but also stating the problem a little bit of, um, you know, what the problem would be if we want to certify the network that there are no adversarial examples. So for example, here, we may have the corresponding certification problem, which is that um, no matter what color glasses we put on the image on the bottom left, um, it is not possible for the network to misclassify it to some other uh, label, right? For the geometric transformations, it would be that uh, any rotation between, uh, let's say, minus five and five degrees, um, is um, is uh, cannot pull the network, right? And um, there is a non-trivial number of rotations potentially, an infinite number, because uh, uh, we're dealing with interpolation here when we're working with geometric transformations. Here is another ex another setting where adversarial examples can happen. This is the setting of reinforcement learning, and here what we have is the following uh, situation. We have an agent which is uh, represented by a deep Q network, right? And what this agent does is it plays the game by uh, looking at the image only and selecting the actions that uh, you know that should be taken, the right action that should be taken. And um, right, so let's see here. Let's let's use the annotation. Um, okay, so over here what we have is um, the following image. And ideally, what you want to happen is when the bow is over here, we are playing this uh, punk, and you know, what you want to happen is that this paddle, uh, the correct action here is that it goes down, right? This is what happens, and this is the action that goes down. And so when the network, when the deep Q network sees that image here on, on our left, it should decide for the, to move the paddle down. And it decides this, right, once it's trained correctly. Um, which itself is non-trivial, by the way, for enforcement learning, but let's say that it's been trained correctly and uh, it's been trained well and it makes the right decision. Now, what can happen is, is that an attacker can come, let's change the color here, can come and he, they can perturb this, uh, you know, this um, image on the left into another image on the right. And then once we 
get perturbed like the image on the right, which again, observably looks pretty much the same, what can happen is it can fool the agent represented by, the, by this DeepQ network into not doing anything. So it may just decide to do nothing, like take the no action. So that, that paddle here will just stay where it is and then uh, one would lose the game because the ball will just you know, go behind the paddle. Right, so what happens here is that um, <clears throat> you know, the attacker, again, can perturb an image and uh, fool the network and fool the classifier or fool the agent in this case. And you know, this setting is um, a bit different in the sense that while we're still perturbing images, there's many of those images taking place as the game progresses. You know, once uh, an action is taken, a new state is obtained, and then the agent is asked again to make a, to make a decision. So here again, adversarial examples can take place, and there's been various works for generating adversarial examples in reinforcement learning, um, like this paper below that I cite, and papers which are defending uh, building networks, which are resilient to adversarial examples. And we recently also looked at the corresponding verification problem and formal training problem. So what is the certification problem here? It would be that uh, within some range of changes that you can make to the image, so within some range of changes that you can make to the image, uh, it is probably so that the DeepQ network would always take the right decision, which is down here, right? So if you train your uh, agent correctly, it will be, you know, defended against adversarial examples, or probably defended, then uh, you may be able to prove that uh, you cannot fool actually the agent by making this kind of perturbations. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on and see some other examples. Um, Here's another example in the natural language processing setting. Here we have text, um, some text about the Super Bowl in black. It says Peyton Manning became the first quarterback ever to lead two different teams and so on and so forth. And when you have that text and you ask the um, reading comprehension system a deep model to answer the following question, what is the name of the quarterback who was 38 in Super Bowl 33? Then, um, the network will, the model will correctly predict John Elway based on the text in, uh, based on the text in, uh, in uh, black, in both. However, if you add this adversarial text here in blue, right, some, some text here that says quarterback JFD hit jersey number 37 in champ bowl, you know, some other uh, 34, then the model actually um, mispredicts the answer to the, uh, to the question. Okay, and so we can add such kind of adversarial text, uh, some kind of distracting text to fool the model and get it to behave, um, get to behave um, incorrectly and desirably. Okay, let's look at uh, one last example here. Um, so in this case, what we have is a speech-to-text translation system. So it takes speech and uh, it translates it to text. Right, so this was a, um, a work that uh, you know attacked those kind of uh, uh, speech-to-text systems. So basically, what happens is, so let's let's, let's use our notations again um, here. So what we have is, is we have the original recording over here on top. We add a little bit of noise. We add a little bit of noise here, and we end up with a new recording over here. So the original recording, you know, gets correctly translated to. Uh, the following text. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. We had a little bit of noise, and what would that noise be? This would be, for instance, a reduction on the volume of the sound in the original recording, um, or we increase the sound a little bit, but very, very little bit imperceptibly so, or maybe even perceptibly, but very little bit the volume, and any human um, pretty much would be able to um, recognize the you know, be able to translate uh, the, the you know this the sound into this into this um, into the original text. However, the deep learning system can uh, be fooled in this way and start producing uh, uh, incorrect translations, garbage translations. For instance, it's a truth universally acknowledged that a single which doesn't make sense, right? So here we again have nicely this setup, which is we have some audio recording, right? And then we have to typically what happens is that this recording gets pre-processed. Uh, by some pre-processing stage, 
and then the result gets fed into the uh, into the neural network. And so when you are attacking the uh, when you are attacking the um, uh, this uh, when you're generating these uh, changes, for instance, in the volume, you'd be uh, general you'd be making changes to the input of the preprocessing state um, to the preprocessing stage, not just at the input of the network, right? Um, okay, so uh, what would be the corresponding certification problem here? It would be that within some range, for instance, of volume changes, of sound changes, like if I make it a little bit louder or a little bit lower, um, then the network would uh, still be provably behaving correctly on those, on those uh, within that range, right? So you may be able to prove this. And uh, only recently we have, uh, we and some other groups have started uh, investigating this uh, certification problem in the context of audio, neuro audio processing. Okay, so let's look at uh, you know, a variant of this, a simpler variant of this, uh, which is just uh, uh, a similar problem. Again, audio processing, again, you have speech to text, but this time it's just speech to classification. So I have a bunch of uh, output labels, for instance, stop, go, left, right, up, down, and so on. And once again, I can have, uh, you know, some original audio recording as zero. It would go for some pre-processing. Then it would, get, it would get fed to the deep model. Could be some LSTM, which would uh, make a uh, classification decision. And once again, I can uh, try to fool the model by changing the volume, uh, the decibel, decibels in this case, of the original sound recording, right? Uh, and, you know, this is this is also just like in the previous case, you can generate adversarial examples uh, here as well. That would be uh, not something that would fool a human. So now you get a bit of an idea that uh, adversarial examples and uh, can exist in different settings. So audio processing, geometric perturbations, physical changes like glasses, um, and uh, reinforcement learning. And for each of these, you know, for the problem of generating adversarial examples, there is the corresponding problem of uh, certifying the network, certifying the model that uh, it lacks adversarial examples within some range, of course, uh, of the uh, original point. Okay, so um, <clears throat> just to give you a little bit of a history of this, uh, of, of how adversarial examples came about. So somewhere around uh, 2006, uh, you know, nearly 15 years ago, um, deep learning models uh, gained their new interest. You know, people start investigating it more. And uh, somewhere around 2012, various work showed that uh, these deep models can achieve very good uh, performance, sometimes even better than humans. Uh, thanks to largely thanks to uh, um, you know the very good label data sets such as uh, ImageNet for instance um, and uh, the increase in uh, processing power in hardware processing power in the um, in the form of G uh, good GPUs um, and so later on somewhere around 2013. Um, Given this, given these advancements in you know, 2000, between 2006 and you know, 2012, and of course all of the advancements much earlier uh, in the early years of, of neural networks, um, you know, community and you know, industry also started looking at how to use neural networks for all kinds of uh, uh, all kinds of tasks. So, for instance, in autonomous driving, right? Um, and so, it it became interesting to understand how these neural networks make decisions, right? What, uh, um, you know, they make decisions, but how are they, how do they make these decisions um, and uh, gain a much more deeper understanding of their operation. Uh, somewhere around 2014, Segedi, um, while trying to understand decision-making, actually discovered that there are examples. And, you know, around 2015 and on, finding these adversarial examples, you know, defending networks, again, models against this uh, in uh, experimental defenses, or probable defenses, uh, became an active uh, research area in all kinds of domains, like audio, geometric, um, video, and many more. Okay? So that's roughly how, uh, how things went on over time. Now, um, one interesting bit here is that uh, you know these adversarial examples were discovered? They exist. 
So one thing that we would like to have here is to have robustness against uh, this unwanted input. Ideally, we would want something like the network to be robust, to be behaving correctly in a sense, um, to, 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 to return correct outputs on all the possible inputs that it can take. Uh, now, generally speaking, this is very impractical because the domain of uh, the input of the neural network is uh, uh, infinite or, or very large or unbounded in most cases. So this, cannot, this space cannot be covered. Um, and so what you know, the community kind of focused here is more on a metric called the uh, local robustness of uh, deep models. And local robustness informally uh, states uh, that a model is uh, locally lo robust if it returns correct outputs on some inputs that are similar to, uh, to the ones that it has seen, okay? So within some range, some, somewhere close, that looks very similar. And people believe that this was actually true uh, if you obtain uh, high accuracy on the, on the test set, you know? Um, and now the question was, you know, why is this high accuracy actually not enough, right? Um, here in the standard setting of training and testing that we have in standard machine learning, inputs in the training and the test set are taken from a, you know, the same distribution. Um, and the standard training aims to achieve high accuracy on, uh, on, the, on the test set that is uh, drawn from that distribution. The problem is that even though you get high accuracy, there may still be many, many uh, very, very similar inputs to the one that uh, you trained or tested on um, that may have, for instance, low probability, uh, low measure under the, um, under the distribution. And so you may have actually never seen them during, uh, during um, training or testing um, right, with the data sets that we have. Um, and so one question that this, this begs really is, uh, well, we haven't seen them, and, and, uh, but it still performs well on some unseen data, maybe just not uh, these adversarial examples. Um, and so what is actually going on? What is the model actually learning, right? So this question is uh, very uh, relevant and various groups are exploring it, right? Um, and here is this uh, kind of mentioned, this funny story and the connection between uh, adversarial examples and uh, Clever Hans, um, which was uh, a horse that uh, many people had thought had actually learned to perform arithmetic tasks like addition and subtraction. And so a person would stay there and uh, you know, they would uh, show the horse arithmetic tasks and then uh, the, course, the horse would solve these tasks, these clever hands. However, um, at some point they decided to slightly perturb the input uh, that the horse sees uh, and they uh, removed the face of the person uh, which, who was present there. And then the horse turned out that uh, uh, couldn't solve arithmetic tasks anymore. So the moral of the story is the horse had actually learned uh, to recognize clues, like social clues from the person, and based on that to make a decision on arithmetic tasks and uh, not to uh, actually learn uh, arithmetic. And you know, this is one possibility that with adversarial examples, actually the model is not uh, learning what uh, you think it is supposed to be learning, but it is learning some uh, uh, perhaps unimportant features uh, using which it uh, you know, makes decisions. And so when there are slight perturbations, then it uh, starts making uh, mistakes, just like uh, Clever Hans. So this question about what the model learns, um, what features and uh, what it understands, it's still something that is very important, a you know, very important research question. Now, again, we can ask this question of why actually do adversarial examples exist more technically? Why are they, they, why are they there, right? And there are a bunch of hypotheses on this, ranging from the data set to the network to the model and so on and so forth. So one hypothesis here that we'll look at now is um, that uh, the neural networks are in fact too linear. So they're made up of you know, a fine, uh, transformations and some activations like rectify linear unit and you know, tanate, sigmoid activations. And if you look at these activations, um, you'll see that, for instance, the ReU on your left here 
you see that this is a piecewise linear function. So linear, 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 and some break, and then again becomes linear. Same kind of with the max out, and even the sigmoid, right? Here, if you, if you chop it up like this with the red lines, you see that it's not, it's not quite piecewise linear, but um, it looks uh, almost like this. Um, and why is that? Uh, well, they cannot be fully linear, right? But you know, why are they designed to be kind of like mostly linear? Um, because linear functions are, in fact, uh, you know, easy to optimize. Now, let's uh, see what happens here. So let's look at uh, let's look at um, uh, these points here on our left with the green and blue points. We have a bunch of points, and here we have a linear classifier that separates the points. Okay, so we have that. Um, so this thing about the linearity was explored both in uh, Goodfellow, Early Works, as well as Madri's uh, 2017 paper, which you can take a look. Uh, these uh, plots are taken uh, taken from there. So on the left we have. Um, you know, these points, a linear classifier separates them, that's fine. Now, if you look what happens in the middle here, right, we have a bunch of points, we still have these black points here, the, the circles, but now we put some boundary around them, some boxes around each point, around which we believe the points should still classify um, the same way as the, as, the, as the center of the square. Now what happens is, if you just have a linear classifier, what happens is that there are some points there in the uh, boxes that uh, you know should classify as the as the center of the box, but because the classifier is uh, linear, it is not able to actually obtain the right decision boundary. So there will be some points here, like the top uh, right, uh, you know, top top uh, star here, top red star here in that region that would get misclassified, and similarly for the um, you know the upper left. Uh, corner of the uh, blue uh, of the blue square here right and so this uh, model here you know very linear model linear model was actually not powerful enough to fit the data properly so it did not fit the data properly and the smaller the model is uh, as argued in the in the Madrid 2017 paper the smaller the model is the more linear it is you know, bigger models are have more capacity and so they can fit more complex nonlinear decision boundaries. If you go here on the rightmost picture, um, <clears throat> here what we have done is we have performed some form of adversarial training, uh, which essentially um, is training not only on the full circles here, but also on points which are inside the squares around this uh, blue dot, uh, around the dots, uh, the green and the blue dots. And so what we can end up uh, obtaining is instead of the linear classifier, which, which uh, suffers from these adversarial examples, you know, these, these regions here in the middle that are in the red stars, what happens now with the, with, the, with, the, with the adversarial training and potentially a larger model is that you can uh, obtain a nice, uh, a more complex, of course, uh, decision boundary here in red, right? And so, um, you know, more nonlinearity um, allows you to um, get rid of potentially of uh, some adversarial examples and fit the data fit the data better. Right? Um, here is a nice uh, investigation which was uh, performed in the um, in this classic 2015 paper, one of the early papers um, by Goodfellow, Schlens, and Segedi. Right. So what we have here is we have the following setting. Right, again, we're studying the linearity of the perturbations. And so what we have here is, so let me take the uh, annotation here. Um, okay. Um, let's just pick some color. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe some, okay, let's pick uh, blue color. And so what, what we have here is uh, on the, on the, on the x-axis, we have some perturbation. So over here we have a, we're going to be exploring some perturbation of a given image. So we are given an image uh, with a digit four here. So we only have one image with a digit four and the correct label for that image is the label four, right? So on the x-axis, we're going to be perturbing this image by some epsilon amount like 0, 5, 10, 15 and so on, right? And then on the y-axis, we are going to see how the logits of the network change for each of this perturbation of the image four, 
So the logits are the values uh, that you obtain uh, right before you do the softmax. So this, you can think of them as some form of unnormalized probabilities. And what we have here in the middle is uh, 10 different um, lines, right? For the 10 different digits that we can obtain in our classification problem. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, so each line represents one logit. So essentially, you know, how does the, so let's pick a line, for instance, the green line over here. Okay, so we have the green line over here, this one over here, okay, the green line over here. This is for the um, classification one, so logit one, right? This is the entries that you see in the logit for, uh, for classification one. So we see that, uh, you, see, you see how it changes with the perturbations here to the original image. And then for each logit, we have, a, we have a function like this, right? So we can see how the particular logit changes as we perturb the image. Now, what is interesting here, uh, let's, uh, let's take a circle, actually, is uh, over here, what you see, is that somewhere around here, right? Um, this is the logit, the behavior of logit four, as we are changing the image and perturbing the image for the, Im the input image. And what we see here is this is the place pretty much where the network behaves correctly. Now we perturbed, uh, perturb the, oh, where is the, this one here, now we perturb the, uh, let's see here, let's say we perturb the uh, input a little bit here, we perturb it, oh, we drew it a bit, uh, now maybe it's too big here, maybe it's like uh, something like this. Um, okay, yeah, something like this, uh, very, very, you know, some perturbations around the zero, and what we see here is that the image gets classified correctly, but there is some non-linearity happening here, right? There is non-linearity going on, and over here, right, in this region, and only when there is non-linearity non going on is when the classification happens correctly. In all the other places where there is, there is linearity happening, like over here, in this part of the plane, and then over here, and then over here, you know, in this ones here, the classification is uh, incorrect. So the four gets classified to some other uh, value. So over here, for instance, it's class classified to this light blue line, which is five. So over here we have five. Uh, this is the classification. And over here up top, you know, on, over here in the left on that side, which is, I guess this is the brown line, this is would be classified as eight, right? Okay, so this is just uh, another, um, another experiment which aims to uh, relate this non-linearity to the lack of adversarial examples and where the network behaves, uh, the model behaves robustly. You can actually do this experiment yourself. You can just uh, take an image and start perturbing it and uh, draw the uh, corresponding logits. Uh, for each logit, you, 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 you obtain a function like this and then you see and uh, see how it behaves, okay? Okay, so this is one concept here of uh, nonlinearity. Um, essentially to avoid adversarial examples or to reduce the chance of adversarial examples, um, you may have to deal with more nonlinearity. Okay, so let's, uh, gives you a little bit of an idea, okay? And I should mention, this is an active research area, right? People are trying to figure out, different research groups are trying to figure out why adversarial examples exist, um, uh, both in terms of the capacity of the network, the data sets, different application domains, and so on and so forth. Very interesting space. Now, though, what we want to take a look at is uh, how do you actually generate adversarial examples, right? I have my model, I have my deep model, and uh, I have some input uh, that potentially behaves uh, correctly, like it gets classified correctly, and um, you know how to actually generate these adversarial examples. And Let's begin. We're going to start looking at uh, some algorithms for doing so. So there are generally two types of attacks for generating adversarial examples, uh, called targeted and untargeted attacks. Right, so a targeted attack essentially aims to misclassify the input, for instance, an image um, to a specific label. So you have a specific bad label in mind, call it an adversarial label, 
and you try to misclassify this input. So the input gets classified to something good, like a panda, and you try to trick it, try, trick the model by changing the input so that it gets classified to something else, like a gibbon. With the untargeted attack, you don't have a target label in mind. What you have is, uh, what you would like to do is to have the network uh, classify the image to some other label than the original one that the, uh, label, um, the label was classified to. So for instance, in our example with the panda bear, it would be, we would want to change the label from panda to just some other animal, whatever other animal it is, doesn't matter, just so that it's not a panda. So the optimization problem for these targeted and untargeted attacks is actually slightly different. One minimizes the loss, one maximizes the loss, but it's still an optimization problem. So typically with gradient, uh, gradient optimization. Okay, so let's take a look at the targeted attack, how that works, um, and what the problem statement is. So what we have here is we're given a neural network F, okay, and the new neural network takes input from some domain X and uh, maps these inputs into some range uh, C. So we are given a neural network and we're given an input X in this domain. And uh, what we're also given is we're given a tar target label T. And what we do know is that this target label T is different from the label that the uh, input X is uh, classified by the model F, right? Otherwise, if it's classified to T, there's nothing else to do. So that much we know. Uh, and what we want to do, what we want to obtain here, we want to obtain a perturbation eta here, such that when I you know, change the input X uh, with this eta, X plus eta here, the adversarial examples, and the adversarial example, then the network F, the model F, classifies these adversarial examples as T. So that's the targeted problem statement. And the untargeted problem statement is uh, basically the same. Again, you have the network F, again, you have an input X, but this time you don't have a target label in mind. You're trying to find a perturbation here uh, to the input such that it gets, which, which, which it classifies differently than the original input X, right? So these are the two uh, targeted and untargeted. One uh, quick point here is um, that there is another classification on these attacks, not just targeted and untargeted. It is essentially how much um, do we know about the model, about the deep model, um, and depending on how much we know, we can employ different kinds of attacks, uh, how much we can observe. So white box attackers, like what white box attack? Essentially, the attacker knows everything. They know the model, they know the parameters, they know the architecture, they have the data. With a black box attacker, the attacker may know the architecture. So it may know that we have an affine layer followed by a, uh, you know, a sigmoid layer, followed by a ReU or some other combination, but uh, they may actually not know the weights. They may not know the parameters of the network at all. And so there is just a note here, just to keep in mind, um, what was found is actually what's interesting is these adversarial examples are transferable. So what it means is that if I have a network, like I have some model, which I have trained with some data, right? And the attacker has no access to this network, right? But they may know some of the layers, some of the architecture, maybe, maybe all the architecture, maybe some of it, most of it, let's say. Uh, what the attacker can do if they have access to the data on which the original network was trained, they can train a mirror network, right? And um, this mirror network will typically have different weights than the original network for various reasons. Um, even if the data is exactly the same and the architecture is exactly the same, you may not know for how long the original uh, network was, was trained, what optimization method it used, so on and so forth. So the two networks will typically have different weights. But what's interesting here is that now, if you find an adversarial example to the mirror network for, over which you have full access using a white box method, then you can take that adversarial input and try it out on the you know on the original network and in many cases this would actually work and so it's not guaranteed to work but um it turns out that this uh, there's this concept of transferability of adversarial examples from one network to another network right um, so one interesting question here is um 
you know, you may think about this already, and that's why I put this, uh, I started discussing it early on about certification. And, uh, and the interesting question here is, well, we have transferability of adversarial examples, so that's just transferability of, of points, concrete points. Um, and the question is, is it true that the, you know, the certification, the convex shapes that we actually obtain, the proof, if you like, of obtained um, for one network, let's say for the mirror network, actually holds uh, for the original network? Right, so you don't have to recompute this proof. That's a very interesting question. So we started looking at it. Uh, I think it's quite interesting uh, whether there is actually transferability on, on, uh, on proofs as well, right? not just on um, adversarial examples. Okay, and so, uh, you know, in this lecture and in general in the course, we're going to be mostly looking at white box attacks, not black box attacks. And uh, if, if we mention some more black box attacks, I'll explicitly say that. Um, Okay, so let's look at uh, perhaps the most well-known white box attack. This is the FGSM, targeted FGSM, which is the targeted, um, stands for fast uh, gradient sign method. And let's see what happens here. Uh, so let's just use the mark marker again here. And um, let's see. So what happens here is we are given an image X. So we're just gonna be using images as an example, just to illustrate our points. So I give it an image X, and what we want to do is we want to compute the loss of that image X uh, with respect to the target label, right? With respect to the label that uh, where we want to drive the network to classify X2, right? That's label T, the target bed label, right? And so what we'll do is we're going to do the following. We're going to uh, take, we're going to compute the gradient of that loss function here, okay? But this time with respect to X. So in the standard uh, machine learning training, you uh, typically compute the gradient with respect to the weights of the network, because that's what you're aiming to, uh, to change, to uh, find weights which minimize the loss. And here, what we're going to be trying to do is we're going to try to find, um, you know, we're going to try to find an, change to X, perturbation to X, which minimizes the loss. And so the gradient with, with respect to the input X. Okay, so the gradient is computed as a standard. There's nothing, nothing surprising here. So it's the gradient of the loss with respect to each, uh, each component, each, each uh, dimension here in the, um, in the input X, okay? So once the gradient is computed, call it G, okay? So once the gradient is computed, Call it G. What we're going to do is we are going to look at the gradient. We're going to look at each entry, right? So we're going to look at each entry. And we are going to determine whether the entry is negative, you know, zero or positive. And then we're going to set the corresponding sign. Okay, so we compute the sign. And what this sign represents informally is uh, this is the direction in which we are going to be optimizing, moving each uh, pixel, each uh, component of the input X. So sign essentially gets you the direction of uh, movement for each uh, pixel, okay? And so once we get the direction of movement for each pixel, so here we get the direction sign, we get the direction of movement for each pixel. What we do is we, so negative direction, nothing, or positive direction, right? What we do, we are going to determine the step size. Um, by how much are we going to be moving in that direction? And in this FGSM, this is given by the uh, epsilon parameter, which is set a priori, typically to a very, very small constant, like let's say 0 0.007, okay? So we are determining the direction, we are determining the magnitude, and then we compute the perturbation eta to the uh, original, uh, input uh, X because we are trying to get the network to classify X to the target bed label T we need to try to get the loss to be uh, to be zero to be as small as possible essentially to minimize the loss 
right? Because we are trying with respect to t, because we are trying to get we are trying to get uh, uh, the network to classify XST, the model to classify XST. And so what we do here is we uh, subtract the value of the perturbation from the original input text because we are trying to minimize the loss. Okay. And so what you see here is that you know each pixel is moved. Um, with the same amount, you know, maybe in different directions, uh, maybe it doesn't move, but when it does move, you know, it doesn't move because there is zero there, but when it does move, they move uh, with the same uh, exact, the same equal amount, okay? So once you compute the perturbed input X prime, you can check whether, you know, this is an adversarial input by checking whether it classifies, the network classifies the X prime T, and if it does, you're done. If it doesn't, um, you can go back again to step one. Traditionally, FGSM is just a one step, one step like this, but you can also perform iterated, iterated FGSM by just doing this one, two, three multiple times, okay? So FGSM, as I say here, is designed to be fast. It's not really designed to be optimal, to find the smallest perturbation or anything like this. Um, and this actually can create uh, problems, uh, as we'll see uh, down the line. So this is the target FGSM method. This is uh, kind of a core component in various adversarial uh, tasks, let's say. Um, so this standard FGSM, we can also do iterated FGSM. All right, so let's move on to the next, uh, okay. The untargeted version is conceptually simi similar to the, target, to the targeted FGSM, the only difference is um, with respect to what label is the loss. So over here, before it was with respect to this T label, which is the target uh, bad label, but this time it's, we're going to make it with respect to S, which is the good label. So X is correctly classified to S, and our goal, just like before, we compute the perturbation, I'll compute this perturbation just like we showed on the previous slide. No difference. This, is, this time is with respect to S. And the key thing is here is that now what we're trying to do, we're trying to maximize the loss. Why are we trying to maximize the loss? Um, um, because with respect to S, because we are trying to get the model to classify the input, the new input, to some uh, label which is different than S. So we want to get away from S as much as possible, right? So the loss, we try to maximize it. And this is the difference in the optimization. One tries to minimize the loss, one tries to um, maximize the loss, okay? So that's what we try to do. Once again, we can check if we succeeded in uh, driving the, um, you know, discovering an input adversarial example X prime, which gets the model to classify it to some value other than the correct label S. And if so, you're done. If not, you can again go back to do this iterative, iterative uh, process again. Okay, so this is targeted and untargeted FGSM, basically gradient-based optimization uh, with respect to the gradient, with respect to the input, not with respect to the weights. So again, standard training, the input is fixed. You're changing the weights to minimize the loss. With these attacks here, targeted and untargeted FGSM, you are fixing the weights of the network but you are changing the input to achieve this, uh, these objectives. Okay, uh, let's uh, move on. So using this FGSM, this is how we obtain this uh, change of the image so that the classification became uh, not, uh, not Fanta, but uh, given, right? Um, and uh, this is done using these techniques and you can, you can try it out yourself, and see if it works. Um, okay, so um, one issue here with this FGSM business is that, as you can see, there really isn't any notion of distance, right? You are taking the original image, you are perturbing this image, and you may perturb it actually, especially if you do multiple iterations, you actually may perturb it uh, a bit too much, like the one in the middle here, and that you may not even recognize or you may perturb it like the one on the right, which may actually not be necessary to perturb it so much because typically all the pixels get perturbed, uh, but it's not clear that you actually need to perturb all the pixels by the same amount, like this, this magnitude. Why does it have to be the same, right? Um, 
So FGSM can sometimes produce these uh, images that are not very nice um, or very distorted images as well. So the fundamental problem here is what we'd like to do is we'd like to perturb the original image or the original point. Now, it could be an image, could be an audio wave, could be something else. Um, you know, perturb it, but only within some distance. We don't want to perturb it, but not too much, let's say. So we need some notion of distance. We need some way to capture distance between, uh, between uh, you know, points, between inputs. Okay, and uh, this brings us to uh, LP norms which are one way to capture distance between uh, these inputs and to define similarity uh, between, uh, between points. We already looked at this in the exercise, I believe, in last, uh, it, it's a uh, recap material. Uh, but essentially what happens here is that um, if you want to compute the, um, the LP distance between uh, two, uh, two points X, uh, X and X prime, two vectors, then um, what you do is you take the component-wise uh, uh, difference, you take the absolute value, so you compute the magnitude of the difference, you raise that to the p uh, degree, and you do that for each uh, component, right? This is what this equation here says. You sum them up and uh, you take the p root of the, of the sum, of the sum. Okay, and so we can compute like this, um, you know, um, distance, LP distance between uh, two points, right? And uh, if the LP distance between two points is, uh, you know, less than some epsilon, then uh, we may say that the inputs are similar. You know, LP is just to note, is just one definition, and it's interesting actually to define metrics for uh, visual similarity. This is just one of them here that uh, has been used in the research literature. So for instance, if we pick P equal to two, you know, you'd end up with the Euclidean distance between X and X prime, right? Um, now, by far, the most um, commonly used norm is the uh, L infinity norm. And what the L infinity norm does is um, it captures the <coughs> maximum of the absolute values of the entry. So it captures the maximum change that, uh, that can happen to the original, uh, to the original input. And so, what it does is just you know, iterate again component-wise, you take the absolute values, the absolute change, and you take the maximum one. So that's the, uh, that's the L infinity norm. And if you wonder how to go from the top equation, just this is not something that we're going to be looking at, um, but if you wanna know how to go from like this equation over here, you now to this one over here, okay, uh, for L infinity, then you can take a look here at this link that is a very short, uh, proof how to go from one to the other so that you can you can obtain this uh, equation for L infinity uh, L infinity uh, L infinity norm. So I should mention again that this is the probably the most commonly used norm for adversarial example generation, adversarial training, certification, and so on. Uh, and some people argue that it you know naturally captures uh, similarity and, 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 and uh, human vision because essentially it perturbs every pixel by a little bit. Uh, as opposed to some other changes like brightening, and lightening attacks, which can change uh, some pixel by a lot. Um, but this is this is a fairly frequently used norm. So uh, let's just let's just see a, I want to give you a, a, an example here, uh, just to get a bit of a of an intuition how how this how this would be. So let's do the following. Let's suppose that we have uh, something like we have a point X. Okay, so this is our original. Uh, input, some image, and then we have some value, let's say 0 0.6, 0 0.8 here. Uh, and so if I want to capture uh, all points that are, or all images or all inputs that are within some um, L infinity norm of distance uh, at most point one from me, from X, then you know, what I'll do is the following. So I would say for pixel one, which is was 0 0.6, I want to capture uh, the maximum uh, change, right, within some range. And so what I'll do is I would say, um, you know, let now the values of P1, because it's 0 0.1, can range between 0 0.5, oops, oops, 0 0.5 and 0 0.7, right, 
And so the epsilon of 0 0.1 is essentially is the radius of, of the bow. Yeah. Um, and then P2 is going to be 0 0.7 and 0 0.9, like this. Right? So this uh, P1, P2 are now intervals, and uh, they capture um, all of the images that are <clears throat> within A infinity, um, you know, A infinity distance of at most to point 0.1 from the uh, input X here. Okay. So one other interesting thing here is again we have the you know we have this we have these ranges here. Um, you know what's nice about it? Uh, these are simple constraints, right? That uh, P1 is in some concrete range, P2 is in another range. And if you want to do certification, this uh, you'd need to consider essentially the, you know, this this these boxes, this hyperrectangle here, um, and um, propagate this uh, conjunction of P1 and P2 for the for the for the model for the network, right? Um, which is easier than if you were dealing with L2, where you'd need to have quadratic constraints and maintain nonlinearity for the network. This is also why. Uh, potentially certification of um, L infinity um, perturbations within some range, some distance, is easier than uh, L2 certification of L2, uh, L2 norm. Okay? All right. Just uh, shift this one here. That stays on the slide. All right. So we have this example here. That's good. Um, I hope that it is clear what the L infinity norm is because we're going to be seeing it in various uh, various places throughout. Uh, so this is for epsilon, just, oh well, let me just put it here. This is for epsilon, uh, epsilon um, 0 0.1. Okay. So um, let's continue. Yeah, all right. Now, as I mentioned already, we mentioned that FGSM can produce, sometimes can produce distorted images, and it's not something that you want. You want more smooth, more nice images, right? Or most more nice perturbations of the input. Okay. And so what we would like to do is we would like to perform targeted attack, but this time with small changes. Like I want a small change to the X, to the input X as possible. So you again have the same setup. You have the neural network F, you have the input X, you have the target label T again as before. So the setting here is exactly the same as before. But now in the output, what I want is I want to find a perturbation eta such that again I classify the perturbed example as the adversarial example as T, but also that I minimize, I minimize the um, you know the eta the norm, the P norm of eta. So I want to make um, eta such that the P norm is minimized. So it's as small as possible, right? Um, okay, so P is typically, you know, L0, L2, or L infinity, often L infinity, L infinity uh, norm. Okay. So, uh, so let's look at the optimization problem here. What would be the corresponding optimization problem more formally? So what we have here is we have the um, following situation. We have our goal is to find eta, where we minimize the um, you know the the norm here, the p norm of eta, right? Trying to make it as small as possible, such that and the network classifies the <coughs> adversarial example to this target label t, and the resulting uh, adversarial example, this x plus theta is in some range, right? It's in this uh, zero one. So every pixel, if you like, is in the range between zero and one. So um, <clears throat> that's what we would like to do. Now, the difficulty here is that um, this constraint <laughs> is actually, in fact, everything here is hard to optimize for. <laughs> but let's start with the first one. Um, so this constraint here in red, uh, this f of x plus eta, uh, equal to t is a hard, hard discrete constraint, which is difficult to optimize with gradient methods. Um, and so one thing that you may want to do and you'd like to do is um, to uh, replace this hard constraint 
with uh, potentially a soft constraint. And here, what we're going to be discussing through the rest of the lecture are the attack methods of uh, Carlini and Wagner, uh, summarized in this uh, classic paper from uh, 2017 on attacking, uh, on attacking uh, neural networks. Okay? So uh, let's take a look what happens here. What are we going to do? So we have the optimization problem. That constraint, the f of x uh, plus eta um, <clears throat> equal to t, is hard to optimize for. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to replace it with potentially a softer objective. So we're going to be doing two simplification to that problem, right? One is this dealing with this hard constraint, and the other one is dealing with the uh, eta, uh, with the p norm of eta when uh, you know, we're dealing with L infinity, which is also hard to optimize uh, as well. But let's start with the first problem of uh, dealing with a hard constraint. So what you know, Kalini and Wagner explored is this idea where you're replacing the hard objective with a, with a, with a softer objective, so this obj t, and the softer objective has the following mathematical property. It says that um, this, uh, this function here, this obj t of the adversarial example x plus eta, if it is less than or equal to zero, right, then you're guaranteed that uh, x plus theta, x plus theta is a, an adversarial example, that it will get classified to the label T, right? Um, okay. And so what they do, um, if you're able, you know, if, you, if you're able to define such a opt function, we're going to look at several examples next. If you're able to do this, um, you know, to define such a function and, and, and you can, you can rewrite your optimization problem as follows. It is just like before, except that this, uh, you know, this, uh, um, uh, now we have the combination of uh, the minimization of the, you know, the norm of P norm of, uh, of eta and the um, objective function, opt, which is scaled by some constant here, C. Okay, so I can define now the following optimization problem is here and try to solve this optimization problem. Now notice that this condition here in step one is a one-way condition. It is not an if and only if. It is possible to have um, x plus eta existing such that f of x plus eta gets classified to t, to the target bad example, yet the <coughs> objective function is uh, greater than zero. This uh, mathematical definition doesn't say anything about this case. This is actually possible. <clears throat> Could be possible. Um, so we're just focusing on the one one way um, mathematical condition. Okay. So um, let's look at just some example functions that Kalini and Wagner experiment um, with the property from the step one. And so here's a couple of functions. Um, one definition could be the just take the take the standard uh, cross entropy loss and uh, subtract one from it, and we'll see in a second why. Another could be just uh, taking the max uh, of zero and 0.5 minus the probability that um, that the model f returns um, the probability of class t under the model uh, f for the input x prime. Okay, so what's the probability that uh, X prime gets classified to T by the model F? Um, okay, in fact, uh, there is a mistake in the original paper with these uh, two loss functions that we had to fix here in the slides. So you can uh, try to find what the mistake is. Maybe you plot it and see. <laughs> um, okay, so let's look at the first function here. And I have simplified the notation just a little bit so we don't carry this P, F, X, uh, T, and so on and so forth. We just use P of T. Uh, so we just plug in the cross entropy loss for, uh, for loss of T. Here we use the logarithm base two, but that's, a, that's, that's within a con constant factor of the standard uh, cross entropy. And so if we look at this function here, if we just pick the standard, you know, pick this uh, lock uh, with base two, um, right? What we're going to see is the following function if we plot it. And it's nice thing that we're plotting it now so that, you know, we can very clearly see what happens. And so what we see here is that when the probability that X gets classified by F as T, is where the red dot is here, where my cursor is, right? The red dot is 0.5 or greater, you know, at that point, 
it will certainly get classified to T, okay, because the probability is above 0.5 or greater. At that point, that the value of the function is negative or zero here at direct dot, okay? And so that function satisfies the condition that we want, the one that we stated in step one. Okay, that's just the way that the function is, uh, is, 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 uh, is, is designed. So this is one function, okay? Um, that's uh, here. That's certainly a lot easier to optimize than this, uh, you know, this hard constraint that we had before. <laughs> Here's another function. Um, so Kalin and Wagner play with a bunch of functions. These are just some of these two functions. And again, we use the shortcut here. Instead of writing P of X T, we just write P of T, just to not pollute the notation here. Um, and so what you see here is that the objective function here is always zero or greater, right? And it is only zero, so it stays at zero as soon as the probability that the model f classifies x to, to t is great, is 0 0.5 or greater, so it will get classified to t by the model f. At that point, the function becomes zero. Here is the right side of the function, okay? And so, once again here, that if condition, one-way condition holds also for that function as well, right? Um, okay, so we have a couple of these functions, um, and um, these are some proxy functions, some soft functions that replace the original hard constraint and once you can, uh, you can work with more easily than the original one, okay? All right, um, and so this is the optimization problem like we had before. Step one, we have uh, this replacement of, uh, of the original function with this, with this uh, objective function and then we solve the following optimization problem here at the bottom. Okay. So it looks like if we just replace the hard constraint with this, you know, this optimization problem over here, we would be done. But unfortunately, in practice, while it sounds, uh, you know, so, sounds like reasonable, it's not actually what happens. Okay. And so the problem here is that this um, term here, when the norm is um, L infinity, when you're using the L infinity norm. Um, it's actually, uh, you know, taking the max of the absolute values of the entries here, of the eta, you know, of, of, the, of the change. This is actually quite difficult for optimization uh, with standard gradient-based methods, okay? And so what we need to do in the rest, in the rest of, the, um, of the lecture is try to see how we deal with that problem as well. So we dealt already with the hard constraint. Now, in, now we need to deal with this uh, eta um, L infinity norm optimization. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the problem. So this gets a bit more technical here. And so as I mentioned already, the L infinity norm of uh, eta is going to compute the maximum change. It's just going to take the absolute value of every dimension in eta and just get the maximum value, okay? So if we look at this example here where we have eta just an example we're going to use throughout to demonstrate the issues. So if I have this eta over here on the left and I have the following uh, vector 0 0.5, 0 0.49, 0 0.48, then the, the L infinity norm of, of, of eta is going to be 0 0.5. Okay, so now let's try to minimize this uh, L infinity function, um, okay, L infinity norm. Uh, of eta. So that's what we're going to try to do. So how would that look like? All right. So the first thing that we we'll need to do is we need to take the gradient of the um, of the um, of the function at this uh, at this point at this point eta, with respect to each of its, each of the dimensions eta one, eta two, eta three, and, and in this case it's just three dimensions. And uh, right, it is clearly you can see that it's easy to see that the gradient in the first dimension is going to be one because you know inf infinite small change would uh, increase the value of, of the max function um, by that by uh, by that amount okay so it's one uh, while for the other dimensions the gradient the the, the gradient will be uh, zero and uh, this is because uh, you know a very very tiny change to these dimensions uh, would actually not change the 
um, change the uh, max uh, the max of the the result of the of the function. Okay, so if we try to do minimization here, right? We still have some factor gamma, just like we scale as usual. Um, what we're going to end up with is the following situation. So after one step here in the first step, we're going to take the original eta, and then we're going to subtract this, um, you know, this value of uh, gamma. Let's say the gamma is 0 0.03. We're going to subtract this from the original eta. We're going to end up with this, uh, with this, with this uh, vector here, the new vector 0 0.47, 4, 9, 4, 8, and and so on and so forth. If we continue optimizing like this, after the second step, we're going to take, uh, you know, the first, uh, you know, the 0 0.47, 4, 4, 9, 4, 8. And we're going to observe that 4, 9 is actually the maximal value here. We're going to reduce it, and we're going to end up with um, now 0 0.46 in the second dimension, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> now, because the gradient is actually non-zero, it's, it's non-zero only, at the max location and uh, zero everywhere else, um, there are two issues here. So one is that we are essentially, you know, slow, very slowly converging here. We are only modifying one dimension at a time here. And the second problem is that this uh, optimization, this minimization of the L infinity norm. Uh, interacts with the other parts of the objective function, this opt function, this proxy function that we discussed before. Uh, and there is no penalty anywhere in the optimization um, that prevents this uh, optimization of the opt function from pushing the values in eta up back up higher. Okay. And so one will end up, as we'll see, one could end up in these oscillating scenarios where we are minimizing eta, but this other optimization, uh, you know, this opt function actually can push it higher. So we have several issues. One is this interaction with opt fun minimization of the opt function, and the other one is that we are very slowly only modifying like one dimension at a time. Okay, so this makes optimization of this L infinity norm with gradient methods um, difficult. Okay, so let's see this oscillation problem. What can happen here? Okay, so now we're looking at the full optimization problem, which also include this opt function, right? Remember the, let me just highlight here. Over here, this is the opt function for which we had several proxies. We looked at two choices for the opt function. The paper of Carlini and Wagner looks at other, other proxy functions as well. Okay, as we saw already before, after one step of <coughs> gradient descent here, we're going to end up with the following new value for eta, okay? Now the problem is, um, what can happen is uh, within this, uh, you know, we're still in this big first step, the optimizer can actually bump up the second location because it's trying to optimize the opt function. So it, it may actually, you know, nothing prevents it from increasing this 0 0.49 uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, 0 0.5. Okay, um, and so, so it may bump up locations up and down um, like this, and that can happen, that's fine. But then after the second step, right, um, you may actually, you know, because this is the highest one, I mean, it was the highest one, four, nine, but then, you know, after the second step, the, L, the minimization of the eta is going to try to reduce this to some value here, right, 0.47, but nothing prevents the optimizer when it's optimizing the opt function from actually increasing this 47 here into this 0.5 here. So one dimension may be reduced, you know, this um, second dimension may be reduced because we're trying to minimize the eta, you know, this, this uh, L infinity norm. And the other one may be increased, the other dimension may be increased because we're trying to optimize this opt function. Okay, so uh, what can happen here is that you can end up with this oscillation and bouncing around, um, okay? So it may not be so great to optimize this um, L infinity norms, minimize it, especially when this other terms is the loss function. If you try it in practice, this is something that you can observe. Okay, all right, so I hope you get the intuition for why um, 
creating this and this and may struggle with uh, minimizing the um, L infinity norm and um, especially when there's other terms like this opt functions whatever functions we are picking there from our choices okay so let's um, continue okay so how would you solve the issue like how would we solve this problem right so once again, just like we did with the hard constraint before this f of x plus eta equal to t, we replaced it with some opt function, right? With certain mathematical property. We may also do the same thing here. So we'll try to solve the problem by replacing the minimum, you know, this, this, um, this function, this uh, L infinity norm of eta with some other proxy function that is potentially easier to optimize, but also that captures more or less distance. Uh, in some way, maybe not exactly as the L infinity, but in some parts similar, okay? So here is one uh, such proxy function that was explored by Kalini and Wagner. And we'll take a look now. Um, and so the idea here is the following. So we're going to be replacing, so let me just put the, yeah. we're going to be replacing the, uh, you know, the, L infinity norm of, of uh, eta with the following uh, proxy function, right? And what you see here is that we have a summation uh, across all of the dimension of eta. And what we do here is just like before, you know, just like in normal infinity, we take the absolute value of the dimension and we, uh, you know, uh, subtract from it the value of, of tau We'll see what tau is. Tau is some kind of ceiling here. And then we take the max uh, of this result with zero. And uh, you know, we sum this over all of the dimension. Okay. And so, you know, this tau, this tau, this hyperparameter essentially, but it actually changes during optimization. Essentially, when the whole thing finishes, we'll see it tends to define, it will define some L infinity bound. Okay, it will define some L when the whole thing finishes. So initially, when you start the process, right, tau will start at one. So now you see what happens. If tau starts at one, okay, that here is the absolute value, okay, this tau i, absolute value of tau i. So if tau starts at one and the values are between zero and one, you are going to end up with everything being zero, right? The whole thing will be zero. Okay, and so what you're going to be doing you know, nothing is gonna happen when everything is zero. And so what you wanna do is you want to start uh, decreasing this tau <clears throat> as the, at every iteration. So by, let's say, by some factor of 0.9. So initially it may be one, then it may become 0.9, then it may become 0.81 and so on and so forth. At every iteration, you know. So if all of, the, all of this uh, um, it i's, uh, the absolute values are less, the change is less than this tau, uh, all of them are less, then, you know, the entire expression will be zero, and then we're going to try to decrease tau, uh, tau to get uh, smaller and smaller uh, values, okay? Um, here's a couple of notes that we're actually going to clarify on the next slide. In fact, under certain conditions, the gradient here is similar to the gradient, or is the same as the gradient of the um, L infinity, uh, L infinity norm. Um, okay especially when tau is large. So now let's see, you know, to see some of these issues, let's see how actually this works on an example. But the high level point here is that we have replaced, we have replaced this, you know, eta, uh, the L infinity norm of eta with some proxy function. And what you see here is that essentially all of the dimension uh, of the, uh, of, of this proxy of, of eta i contribute to the value, aim to contribute to the value of the, uh, of the, uh, of this proxy function. But let's see on the next slide, I have prepared an example um, that hopefully clarifies um, some of these points once we see them in, in an real example, I think it will be clear. Okay, so actually this example was prepared based on many questions last year. Uh, so hopefully we've, we are able to clarify some points here. Okay, so what we have here is, um, you know, we start with the, let's call this uh, L of eta, this expression here, the sum over the maxes. 
because uh, we don't want to be writing it every time. And we're going to start with this eta over here. Let's see. Um, we're going to start with this eta over here, some value over here. Okay, and we're going to be working with that. Okay, so let's begin and see how the optimization will work now with this um, proxy function here, okay? So we are only going to be showing the optimization of this uh, proxy function, L of eta, and not like the L of eta plus the opt, just to get the point across to see what happens, okay? And to illustrate this relationship with optimizing the, uh, just the, the true L infinity uh, function. No. Okay, so let's start with tau equal to one, okay? So obviously when tau is equal to one in our function, uh, our function will be zero and uh, there's nothing to do here. So we're going to be decreasing the tau when everything is zero, when all of the elements, the absolute value of all the elements in, ta in eta i are less than tau, then we are just annealing down, down this tau by some factor, let's say <clears throat> 0.9. Okay, so let's start with point nine. If, if you look at our numbers here, well, again, everything is zero. So we need to anneal down more and so on and so forth. So we keep annealing down and after some number of iterations, what we're going to end up with is the first tau where the L of eta is actually not zero. So there is some absolute values of eta i, some components whose absolute value is actually potentially greater than, you know, greater than tau. Now let's see what happens in the first step. Okay, so we apply the function and what we're going to get here is uh, you know, the following situation. This would be the value here. You'd get something like 0 .01, 0 0.014. So the first uh, dimension, the first dimension is going to be less than the, you know, the value uh, <coughs> of tau that we have. But the other two dimensions are actually going to be greater than the value of tau. And if they are greater, then we're going to keep them. If they are less, like the first dimension, then we just set it to zero. Okay, so we end up with this value of 0 0.014. And so now the question is, what is the gradient of this L function of this proxy function with respect to the, uh, with respect to the eta? Because that's the thing that we want to change, right? And now because, um, you know, both dimensions, you know, potentially all dimensions here contribute to the value, um, you know, to the value of, of, of L, um, then for all of these positive dimensions, right, we are just, uh, the gradient is going to be one. Because like a very, you know, small change here is going to change the value of the L by, uh, by that amount. Well, this dimension, you know, the, the value here, the gradient here is zero. Uh, this entry is zero because, uh, right, just like before. And so, as before, we can update the data as usual. You know, we can update it again by some factor, some, uh, some, some lambda, we reduce it again, and we continue with the next step, okay? So this is how this, uh, this is going to work. Uh, this works, um, okay? So multiple dimensions contribute so a function is easier to optimize and multiple dimensions contribute to the, um, to the, uh, to the progress, to the, to the optimization process. Few, few notes here. So within each iteration, right, there can be case steps. So, so over here, so we just showed one step, but for one iteration, we have a fixed tau. So this iteration here, the tau is 0.478, and we may have multiple steps, each of which <coughs> updates the value of, of eta, right? each updates eta. So we keep updating. Now, after some point, potentially, you know, this eta is going to be get, you know, it, 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 the norm, you know, the, the, the eta is going to be updated. And then it could be the case again that the eta, eta gets small, the change gets small, which is what we want. But then let's say, you know, uh, if after k steps, we just reduce, reduce, reduce this eta, and we still have something greater than a tau, uh, some change which is greater than tau, than what we want, then um, the entire optimization will stop, right? And this is, this is what we would get. We just couldn't 
uh, get this eta to be less than the tau that we that we wanted uh, that we set here. Now, if you know L of eta is zero, it means that uh, all of the entries are less than uh, tau. The absolute values of all that is less than tau, and then optimization will continue as we showed already you know, times the previous tau. So we already showed before the next iteration. You know, inside the code there is uh, various uh, stopping criteria. Um, so if you read some, you know, predefined value of tau here, it gets more and small and small. Uh, then you, then you, uh, then you also stop. Um, now, so we we stop like this. We go, we go like this. We go, 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 and then when you stop, of course, when you stop here with the eta, you can check whether you have. Uh, you know whether you have an, 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 an adversarial example or not. Um, now, when the optimization stops, okay. If you want to have a bound on the L infinity norm for which you actually, you know, where you stopped, uh, all you need to do is just look at the eta, at the iteration, at the iteration before the last one, because that eta, we know. All of the values, um, all the components in eta were less than tau, and so we do know that for that eta at this iteration before the current one, uh, this this the infinity, infinity norm is bounded by this uh, is bounded by this tau. So we have discovered the tau, you know, in the previous iteration, uh, for which the change that we are doing to the input is um, the infinity norm. Is uh, of that change is bounded by this it, by this tau, so we know that for sure. Um, okay, <clears throat> so this may or may not, of course, find an adversarial example. You know, when you finish here, when you when you when you terminate, you can take a look whether you know you have found an adversarial example or if you have uh, not found an adversarial example. And uh, you know, we already have one way we can we can test that by just evaluating the opt function. And seeing if it is less than or equal to zero, and if it is, then well, you have found an adversarial example because then it is guaranteed that this label gets classified to T. We already discussed this before. Of course, you may find an adversarial example um, here, even if the opt function is greater than zero because it's only one direction. The if, right? Um, okay. So this is how optimization works with this proxy function. Um, and this is how you can get guarantees on the, uh, you know, you minimize this, this eta, but you also get guarantees on the L infinity uh, norm here uh, that you, that you uh, of this eta, it's guaranteed to be less than that. Okay, one interesting point here is uh, one question that one can ask is, well, the gradient here, you know, we see it over here is not, is not like the gradient of the L infinity norm because there only in the gradient only one entry was a one, which is the maximum value. And here there are like more entries here, right? Um, so one question is, when does the optimization behave like the L infinity norm? And the answer here is intuitively when the tau is fairly large. So when the tau is fairly large, then you would have very few entries in eta whose absolute values are uh, greater than tau. There may be few. If it's too large, then there will be none. But as you go down with the tau, maybe you get some, like one, two, three, or some of those, whose value is actually greater than tau. And there, you get a very sparse uh, gradient where everything is zero, but only a few places are one, or maybe even only one place is one. And then you behave like the L infinity uh, optimization. You get that kind of gradient, the same or similar. If you want to be very precise, um, you know, here I have written the condition when you get exactly the same gradient. So all you need to do is you need to take the, the, the I mean, that's not something that we want to do, um, but we're just discussing this connection now. So if I take the eta here and I take the top one, um, I take the top one, the highest value here in eta and the second highest value in eta, okay. Um, and then I pick a tau which is between these two, right? Then uh, the gradient will be um, only one element would essentially pop up above tau, which is at a, uh, eta top one, and then the gradient 
of this uh, proxy function here will be the same as the gradient of the L infinity norm of the theta, right? So intuitively, when the when the taus are large, you behave like this, uh, uh, like the optimization with the L infinity norm on eta. And when they get smaller and smaller, then you uh, you know then you then you start uh, becoming uh, considering more dimensions and changing more than one dimension at a time, right? Um, okay, so. Um, this is this is some points here about the optimization uh, with this with this uh, proxy functions and um, you know of course naturally you can think it also the other way around if you are having you know, smaller and smaller values of tau which meaning meaning more and more entries in the eta are greater than tau whose absolute values are greater than tau then you are more and more likely to um, not finish this minimization um, process where the L of eta is zero, where all the entries are less than uh, less than tau, because there are just too many entries which are less than which are greater than tau at this point. So it's interesting, essentially, up to which point it actually gets behaves close to the um, gradient, uh, close to the L infinity norm optimization, and uh, when does it stop doing that? Um, because if you have too low of a tau, then you are more likely to terminate because you just, after k steps, you just not have, you still end up with this condition over here that we wrote, uh, where A of eta is uh, not equal to zero. Okay, so the takeaway points are, we have a proxy function that is easier, easier to optimize, that's one takeaway point. And then the second takeaway point, um, there is more than one dimension that gets uh, optimized at the time of the eta. And we can give guarantees on the eta in terms of L infinity norm by just taking the tau at the previous iteration. Okay, good. So let's, uh, I hope that, that this gives you uh, some idea. Um, we also have an exercise on this topic so that it can, it can, we can play more, more with it. Um, okay, so in summary, we have this optimization problem. Um, we had the original optimization problem, then we replace it with the um, with the function opt, um, which is a one-way implication, has the following mathematical property, and we ended up with this optimization problem over here in the bottom. And then what we showed is that uh, let me just use the order again here. So what? So first, this this here is the result of one replacement of this hard constraint, and here what we show <clears throat> showed in the previous slides is that we, um, we had a replacement also for that function. So we have two proxy functions here that we can play with to make the optimization problem easier and uh, faster to solve. And uh, the replacement here was such that you can actually guarantee some bound on the, uh, on the eta, L infinity bound on the eta that you, that you, uh, that you found, okay? Um, with this tau. Um, okay, one thing we haven't looked at is, over here, um, there is some form of constrained optimization because you want the result to fall into these boundaries. We'll look at this next time. That's also something that, that, that comes up very much in the adversarial training as well. Um, all right, so the moral of the story here, the high level point is that we have proxy functions that make it easier uh, for us to perform optimization and to incorporate this uh, idea of trying to find small perturbations, small values of eta uh, with respect to the L infinity norm um, and that produce nicer images. And as we'll see next time, they, actually, they, they do actually produce nicer images because the perturbations are smaller uh, to the original image x. All right, so uh, in summary, what we covered in this lecture was, uh, we looked at um, examples, additional more examples in various application domains of adversarial examples like audio, geometric perturbations, uh, reinforcement learning, natural language processing, uh, speech to, you know, in the audio setting, we looked at uh, speech to text, and then we looked at speech to um, classification, just uh, stop, go, up, down, and so on. In the process, I mentioned 
all the adversarial example generation problem, but also the corresponding certification problem that arises in this uh, in these application domains. And one thing to not forget is that we are dealing not just with the neural network, but with the entire pipeline of you know geometric transformations, for instance, rotation, translation, sharing, and more, and their combinations, of which there is an infinite number. And uh, we are also dealing with pre-processing in the audio space, with the NLP in the computation of the embeddings, and so on and so forth. Okay, um, so that was that. Then we looked at some reasons for why adversarial examples uh, exist. And one uh, particular point we looked at was um, linearity, nonlinearity, and we you know, uh, discussed some investigation which said that um, you know, when the model is, behaves too linearly uh, with this, in this classification for the particular input, then you get adversarial examples, and when there is more, more nonlinearity, then you are less likely to get adversarial examples. These are just some investigations, and this is a pretty much an open area of research. And then we started looking at uh, techniques for generating adversarial examples. So we looked at the uh, fast gradient sign method, both targeted and untargeted, uh, one step FGSM, uh, where we had minimization of the loss function when we have targeted because we want to drive it to a particular target label. And we had maximization of the loss function when we're dealing with an untargeted because we want to get away from a particular label. Okay. One of the issues with FGSM turns out is that because there's no notion of distance, how we are perturbing the input, every pixel is pretty much perturbed by the same amount. You can end up with images that are not so nice, uh, too distorted. And therefore we started looking at uh, you know, how to generate images, adversarial images, adversarial inputs that are nicer, not so distorted, and there we had to incorporate the notion of a distance, so we needed some notion of a distance, like uh, uh, LP norms, and specifically uh, L-infinity norm, which is one of the most used norms, and uh, we started looking at um, other methods for generating adversarial examples, which try to minimize the perturbation, specifically we looked at Kalini and Wagner's uh, attacks, some of them, and the core idea, the high level idea there was to replace the difficult to optimize hard constraints, of which there were two. Uh, this was the hard constraint of um, getting the model to classify the per perturbed image to a given label T, and then the uh, minimization of the perturbation, uh, the L infinity norm of the perturbation. And the core idea was to replace these constraints with the easier to optimize uh, uh, functions so that. Uh, we can have a higher chance to solve this optimization problem. Um, so this is this is the so ultimately a lot of this adversarial example generation training and uh, provable defenses and all of this comes down to defining a good uh, a suitable optimization problem. So this will be a recurring theme that we are, is going to uh, be appearing throughout the uh, throughout the uh, throughout the lectures. Um, okay, great. Um, so I hope you got an idea about adversarial examples. And next time we're going to talk a little bit about dealing with constraints in adversarial examples, like how to restrict the inputs to be within certain range, and what optimizers to use, and switch to continue to adversarial defenses. So I hope that you um, enjoyed the lecture, and uh, see you next time.